the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. It's a delight to be here. And um, I'm, I'm responsible for the gospel this morning. It wasn't the gospel that was appointed. That's why you had a little problem with the, <laughs> with the uh, gospel book. Um, this story of the Syrophoenician woman became very important to me. As I was writing the book, I, I was preaching at a friend's church, dear friend, and this passage came up. And as I was studying it, some things jumped out at me that um, I hadn't seen before, and I'm not sure that too many people had seen it because in my studies I didn't come across it. But anyway, it's, it's a story about God's grace, plain and simple. So in the gospel, this woman comes to Jesus. We are not given her name, only her ethnicity. She's a Syrophoenician. That means that she's not Hebrew. She's not Jewish of Jewish descent. She has healing for her little daughter. Jesus doesn't simply say no in refusing her request, but he offers her a parable about dogs getting scraps from the table. On the surface, Jesus seems to be likening her daughter to a dog. I don't know about you, but if you would say that about my daughter, or my granddaughter, I would revert to my marine mentality with you probably. So how are we to respond to this story? How does the Syrophoenician woman respond? First of all, we do have to consider the context, the point at where we are in the Gospel of Mark. I don't know if you've been following the Gospel of Mark, but um, in the immediate chapters leading up to our story, Jesus has been on a very busy iter itinerary. He's been teaching throughout all of Judea and into the Galilee region. There have been numerous healings of all kinds, uh, with all kinds of illnesses, diverse illnesses, leprosy, all kinds of things. There have also been um, enormous crowds that have come in to Jesus to hear him preach. Apparently, he was quite this preacher, and people would come and hear him. And while they were listening to him, or at the end of it, um, oftentimes he would do healings. And his reputation spread. Uh, remember, he fed 5,000 people. And he's been going out through, uh, throughout the region with all these demands, people wanting to be healed, people wanting to hear him preach, people wanting to be fed. And not only that, he's been arguing with the scribes and the Pharisees. And personally, I think that probably was the straw that broke his back. Arguing with religious professionals um, is, is, is not the best way to spend a day. Would that be fair to say? Okay, we can be a little bit pompous or something, I'm not sure. Um, not only has he been dealing with outsiders, but he's been dealing with the disciples. And I don't know if you've been a, with a group of people um, over a long journey. Um, sometimes you, you just want to get away from them, don't you? You're tired of talking. You're trying to hear, tired of hearing them complaining about whatever they're complaining about on this day or something. Now, Pamela and I have been traveling, but we don't do that, Pamela. Pamela tells me what to do, and I generally try to please her. Not always successfully. So, but my point is this: up to this story, Jesus has been traveling around. He's been healing. He's been doing all kinds of things and interacting with the scribes and the Pharisees. And to be quite honest, I think he's dog tired, and so he goes away to Tyre, to the region this, where the Syrophoenicians live. 
Now, they are not close neighbors. They are not people who communicate with each other very often. They have their different practices, and the Jewish people obviously had their practices. So Jesus goes off to this region of the Galilee where he is not a celebrity, and if known at all by the locals, they would likely associate, um, not associate with him because he was of Jewish ethnicity and religious. So there were deep religious differences between them. Not only that, but the Hebrews and the Syrophoenicians have been at war for a thousand years and more. They've been neighbors and that's what they do. Every hundred years or so they fight. Into this scenario comes the Syrophoenician woman coming to Jesus with a request. This request is not for herself, but it's for her daughter. She has some kind of an affliction, a demon in their medical language. Because she's a woman, likely married because she has a child, but not necessarily, but she's a woman. She's a Syrophoenician, therefore non-Hebrew. Jesus should not be talking to her at all. And to be honest, she probably shouldn't be talking to him. In fact, I can guarantee she shouldn't be talking to him. But Jesus responds to her request, and he does so uh, not with an action, but with a parable. Frederick Beekner, one of the great Christian writers, um, and I would recommend him to you, writes wonderful essays and wonderful things about faith. Beekner calls parables short stories with a big meaning. Parables are also tests of sorts. They're a story. And when somebody tells you a story, at the back of your mind, you've got to be thinking, why am I hearing this story? Why is she telling that story to me? Am I to learn something? Am I to see myself somewhere in that story? So when a parable is given, the question is, do you get it? Do you understand what I'm saying? Parables are invitations to see something about our lives that we ourselves are not seeing. Parables ask, invite us to ask questions. Who am I in the story? What do I not see about myself? Is there some response that I need to do? Remember Jesus telling the parables? And what happens after he tells the parables to a crowd? He comes back with the disciples, and what did they do? What did that mean, Jesus? <laughs> Even the disciples didn't get those parables most of the time. They often quibbled among themselves. So back to the parable at hand. Is Jesus comparing her child to a dog? She's, in, she's asking for scraps for her child. And Jesus says, the dogs don't get the scraps until all the children have eaten. Remember also that dogs were scavengers in the ancient world. They weren't nice little pets like we have. They were scavengers. And so you did throw just whatever's left the bones, whatever's left over. If I were that woman, I would be incensed. My mic is hitting the, my, my, I'll, I'll pull back from my face. It's hitting my face. Okay. Sorry. If Jesus had said that to me, I would have been incensed. It's also not a good look for Jesus, is it? This is the Son of God. He's supposed to love people. And yet, he comes off pretty harsh here. Now, you could say, Jesus has been on a busy tour throughout the whole region. He's tired. He's exhausted physically, mentally, and maybe even spiritually at this point. We can make excuses for him. But still, responding with this story, this parable, to a woman who only seeks healing for her daughter. Some people might say it's sexist, maybe racist, or just plain insensitive. Uh, 
I've been known to be accused of being insensitive sometimes by my wife, who loves me dearly and who I love. But we can always come off that way. Have you ever heard the story? I, I heard the story about W.C. Fields. He was at home reading the Bible one day, and one of his friends came in and he says, what are you doing reading the Bible? And supposedly W.C. Fields says, I'm looking for loopholes. I always like that line because I think oftentimes we as Christians, we as followers of Christ, we look at the stories and we pick and choose what we like. We're looking at how do we fulfill the rules easily? Is that fair enough? What's, what's the shortest way? What's the quickest way? The people of God that Jesus has been dealing with over the past several chapters in Mark are people who almost all are looking to fulfill the rules. Remember, he's, he engages the scribes and the Pharisees, and they say, this is what that means. This is what you have to do. And Jesus turns that all upside down. In a way, by having these rules, it's a way we can also find a loophole. If we know a rule, we can figure out a way around it, maybe. This woman, however, is not looking for a loophole at all, at all. She doesn't ask Jesus anything about that. But she comes back with her own parable. And her own parable is about grace. She doesn't answer as an outright outraged person. She says, sir or Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Even the dogs get crumbs. She answers Jesus' parable with a parable of her own. And then I got to thinking about it. Maybe Jesus wasn't insulting her at all. In fact, quite the contrary. Maybe Jesus was testing her. It's an invitation. Do you know who I am, what I'm about? Or are you just looking for special effects, just looking for miracles? You've heard that I raised somebody from the dead. You heard that I healed somebody. Go ahead and do that special little trick and, and uh, heal my daughter. Jesus' own people haven't understood most of what he said. Jesus came to feed the people of God, God's cho chosen children. She picks up on the feeding that Jesus offers in the parable. Indeed, she acknowledges, feed the children first, but don't forget the dogs, the outsiders, the least, the outcast. They weren't the crumbs, don't they? The crumbs that drop on the floor, don't they even warrant that? This parable that Jesus offers the woman sounds harsh, but if parables and stories and poems are invitations to ponder something deeper at work, then this woman understands better than many of Jesus' own people and even the disciples understood. The Syrophoenician woman answers Jesus with her own parable. And one scholar says it was a daring repartee. What a gall does this woman addressing this man in that manner? But she does. And Jesus responds as he always does. He responds with grace. This is the one gift that God offers the world from the beginning with Adam and Eve until up to all our time with you and me and all the other notorious sinners throughout history. Jesus always is offering us grace. And even though at first I thought this sounded harsh, I realized as a parable, he's trying to see what's in her heart. Where does this request some, come from? Do you just want a miracle and go on your way? Or do you want a life transforming experience with God? She is the consummate outsider, shows Jesus that she knows how far-reaching God's love is for humankind, 
indeed for the whole cosmos, of which she is among the least, the littlest, and the lost. Jesus responds no longer in parables, but by, grace, by a gracious healing. Go, the demon is gone. My takeaway from this story, and as I was reading the Gospels, is the only outsiders in God's kingdom are those that think they deserve to be insiders or those who seek loopholes. There are no loopholes, only grace. The demons have no power in God's kingdom, and there are not just crumbs, but bread and wine for all. Amen.